Hello, this is ID Talks brought to you by Salto uh, Inclusion and Diversity Resource Center. This spring of 2022, we are talking about interface dialogue for community and peace building. This series will take you on a journey through faith, belief, and how to build projects to encompass different perspectives in your youth and community work. Uh, today is our... Um, one of our last uh, ID talks for this season, and today we are going to speak about dialogue and peace. A big word that very often we don't know how to address. Peace and conflict are very often addressed in non-formal learning and youth work, but what sets interreligious conflicts apart from other types of conflict? Let's see the role of interface dialogue in conflict prevention, conflict transformation, and peace building and how youth work and youth programs like Erasmus Plus, for example, can support the work on intercultural learning and peace building. Today, we are going to discover this interesting topic with a colleague from Jordan, Mamon Kriesat. Um, he is an executive with multiple years of experience in both business sector, non-formal sector and volunteering projects. Uh, currently uh, working uh, in leadership positions for two prominent non-profit non organizations in Jordan. One is the United Religions Initiative in MENA region that is also um, having about 100 autonomous members that Mamun provides guidance and support to. And the other organization is Desert Blossom. In these capacities, he's, he, he's overseeing a number of different community development programs, and many of them focused on peace building, conflict transformation, women empowerment, and much, much more. Without further ado, Mamun, I would like to pass you the floor because I think you could present yourself way better than myself. Let's have a great ID talk, everybody. Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us in this springtime and being indoor instead of being in sun, as <laughs> Anna said. Uh, you introduced me very well. Uh, I would like to add that uh, I have a like a, a personal mission is uh, getting people together. And I believe uh, magic can happen if we get people from different cultures, different religious traditions together and share the wisdom so we can make our world a, a, a better place. So I, I will uh, start immediately being conscious with time. As Maria and Anna said, this is very complicated. Uh, the program is not, is not, is not easy to, to discuss these topics. Uh, especially uh, virtually or online, but we will do our best because you know the the body language and the emotional intelligence tools are important when we are discussing such a sensitive things for everybody. I think, even though that uh, some people said during my work with young people, oh, we are atheists, we are secular, we don't want to talk about religion, then with time we discover that religious tradition is still strong and is still uh, affecting our behavior wherever we are from different backgrounds, different cultures. So uh, we cannot deny that the uh, religion is still uh, a major player in our social, political, economic lives. And I, I would remember one, one time I did the, like a survey with the, some young people in Europe who believe that they are atheists. I said, okay, uh, what did you take from religion? Then they said, all our traditions and ethics are taken from religion, even though that we are uh, not religious. So the idea is, even if we are not practicing, we still you know, echo all religious teachings and uh, traditions. 
So today's topic, as I said, is very complicated because it's overlapping with many things, uh, intersect with many things in our lives, uh, especially uh, economic and social aspects of our life. So we will talk about how interfaith can contribute to conflict prevention, conflict transformation, and peace building. Also, we will share some uh, ideas how youth programs, especially Erasmus Plus, contribute to, le to learning about uh, intercultural uh, aspects and peace building. First of all, just I, I would like to start with uh, a quick interactive, let's say, exercise. I need you to write one word in the chat that you believe represent or your understanding to what interfaith dialogue is. We just write one word uh, in English, please, to understand it. What you understand or what does interfaith means to you? Only one word. I give you like uh, 30 seconds for this. Uh, let's see how you understand interfaith. Understanding, community, engagement, respect, communication, openness, communion, respect, tolerance, consciousness. So it seems that you are aware of the concept. Well done. Uh, you mentioned many things about uh, interfaith dialogue, which is essential for interfaith. Uh, for for me, I like this, uh, let's say, definition or uh, the way that they define interfaith dialogue. It is about positive and cooperative interaction. You need to be, uh, your mindset set will need to be prepared to be positive. Cooperative, it means that you want to cooperate to reach a common goal. Uh, it's be between people of different uh, religious faith or spiritual beliefs. Even for us uh, in URI, we consider agnostic and atheist as, as spiritual approach to life. So we consider them uh, part of this interfaith dialogue. So the aim is to create or promote understanding. Understanding means to understand what is uh, important, what is common, what is different between the, the religious traditions. This understanding does not mean only what's common as uh, people tend to think, oh, we need to understand how we can cooperate, how we are similar. This is not uh, really full interfaith, let's say, dialogue. We need to understand differences and uh, common things, as well as well as well as the the background behind uh, each religious traditions. To increase acceptance and tolerance, you mentioned the word respect, which is somehow within the concept of acceptance and tolerance. Uh, even though some some uh, culture, especially Arabic culture, the word tolerance may uh, in, in, in imply something negative because if you want to tolerate something, that means you uh, impose impose it in yourself. You, somebody uh, ask you to do it. We like to use the word uh, cohabitants or a mutual respect instead of tolerance. So this is uh, to get uh, the uh, the core issue of interfaith dialogue is understanding to increase acceptance and respect, let's say. Have you ever stopped to ponder what might happen if humanity stopped building walls? Not the physical walls that provide us with shelter and security, but the metaphorical walls that we construct between ourselves and others. Walls of division, born out of fear and misunderstanding, that often serve to isolate us more than they protect us. Picture this. A long time ago, in a world where people lived as one, 
a Jewish man decided to erect a wall. This wall, built out of a desire to protect his people and preserve their customs, stood as a stark division between his community and the rest of humanity. Soon after, a Christian man inspired by the Jewish man built his own wall. His intention was also to safeguard his community and their beliefs. However, the wall he erected further fragmented the unity of human beings. Not long after, a Muslim man, following the example set before him, constructed another wall. His wall too was designed to keep his people safe and their traditions intact. Yet this wall only served to exacerbate the division among humanity. Each wall, though built with good intentions, created an unseen barrier that made it challenging for people on either side to connect. They tried to overcome these barriers, to listen, to understand, to reach out. But the walls were too high, too thick, too intimidating. Over time, the inability to connect gave birth to fear and suspicion. Rumors began to circulate, negative stereotypes took root, and misconceptions flourished. The walls that were supposed to protect and preserve were now breeding grounds for division and discord. As the years rolled on, the walls grew higher, the divisions deeper. The people, once united, now lived in isolated pockets, their understanding of each other clouded by the walls they had built. The unity that once was seemed like a distant memory, replaced by a world fragmented by walls of division. But what if we could tear down these walls? What if, instead of focusing on what divides us, we focused on what unites us? What if we celebrated our differences, rather than allowing them to separate us? In conclusion, the division among humanity symbolized by these walls has done more harm than good. It has fostered fear and mistrust, and it has isolated us from one another. Yet the power to change this lies within us. The importance of unity cannot be overstated. It is through unity that we can begin to understand each other, to tear down the walls that divide us, and to build bridges of understanding, respect, and love. So, the next time you see a wall, ask yourself, is it protecting or dividing? Is it fostering understanding or fostering division? And most importantly, what can you do to help tear it down? Because in the end, we are all part of the same human family, and it's high time we started acting like it. I shared this video just to summarize my experience with Interfaith. It happens uh, that I joined URI like more than 20 years ago, 23 years ago exactly. And I was asked to have a regional conference. So I invited people from MENA region, especially from religious, the main, the main religious uh, traditions in MENA region. And at that time, nobody show up i i managed to get like seven people and uh, it's not a conference i cannot do a conference so i i asked my colleagues in uri europe to send me some uh, religious people from europe so we did we we invited around 20 europeans and we managed to get 10 with jordanian and the idea when we when we have our first uh, Conference, uh, the religious people from MENA region, let's say from the main three, four dimension, let's say, they didn't share anything. So it seems that they, they already uh, established uh, a lot of stereotypes, a lot of uh, misconceptions about the other. So uh, I found myself, me and my colleagues talking to ourselves, no interaction. Uh, next year, we worked on, on it to have more people. So we, we managed to get, uh, I remember, uh, 10 uh, people from Druze uh, minorities in the MENA region and uh, other people from different religions. And the issue is all 10, uh, these those 10, they never say anything. So it was wasn't like a, an interfaith conference because people are not talking, people are afraid. They, they they come and they just listen. So with time, I start to explore why, and I start to establish relationships. Uh, we did a lot of activities, even they are 
not young people because young people are not attracted to attractive attracted to interface so we did a lot of activities and we become like friends then the magic happens and they start to talk when we ask why you didn't talk before because they they have like a well established uh, negative stereotype about the others so the idea is the more you get people together the more you establish relationships it's about relationships if you manage to establish relationship you can manage any interfaith dialogue and with interfaith dialogue you can establish strong bonds relationships and friendships that can make the positive change so uh, interfaith is about building confidence relationship friendship and try to work together with shared wisdom of all religions now for example uh, when we when we do uh, our conferences we receive more than 100 application in the past we were struggling to to get uh, uh, the number of the minimum number of 20 people now we are getting more so with time i'm speaking about 20 years of work we manage to establish a strong friendships and relationships between people of different religion so the idea is not to give up to take your time slowly you can manage to do the meaningful interfaith uh, dialogue so uh, why we do interfaith? Because we want to do, we want lasting, just and lasting peace. Uh, we need to understand that there is always negative peace refer to the absence, the absence of violence, which is, does not mean that people are happy. There are, they might, this might include uh, hidden conflicts. So we cannot force, uh, positive peace we can force negative peace but this is not what we want we want positive peace where the restoration of relationships the justice uh, create creating fair and just social systems that serve the needs of people this is what we are looking for a positive peace so the peace itself is a framework including many many systems that help unfold the conflicts in peaceful means to create a positive uh, change. This is what we are targeting and what we can contribute as interfaith activists in this. So you understand, I think, from your daily life, what's conflict? Conflict is a situation in which unacceptable differences, whether in interest, values, expectation, opinions, idea, happens or occur between uh, individuals or groups. Uh, I would like to refer it as a relationship. Conflict is a relationship, is not something negative. It is a relationship between two or more parties who have or who think they have incompatible goals and not to 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 misunderstand the co the concept of conflict because some some people uh, refer to the conflict as a struggle or fight and um, which is okay it's 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 correct but we need to speak it as a state of disagreement and opposition now in our uh, this presentation We need to understand one thing that conflict is something natural. We cannot avoid it. It's inevitable. It's something we need to live with it. And there's many people believe we need to manage conflict because it's natural. Manage its mean, keep it, but reduce its uh, adverse uh, impact. Despite the fact that uh, conflict as a term refer, it's a negative, ha it has negative implications, but it can be positive. Many, many, uh, let's say social changes 
major social changes happened because of conflict. If you are a minorities in a country and you didn't uh, fight for your rights, you will lose your rights. So a lot of minorities can fight for their rights in in peaceful way and make the change. Also, imagine that you are uh, combining different perspectives from different religions, religious uh, traditions, and uh, imagine how creative and innovative you're going to be. This will inspire your imagination and find uh, creative solutions for your problems. So it's, it's a very healthy thing to have it. Also, it's improve, it improve the problem solving and clarify thing. If you kept your things without saying, without fighting with it, nobody will understand it. So it's good to clarify things. And it's uh, a way to involve people. People, when they have conflict, they involve in relationships. They start to strengthen the relationships. They contribute to the decision-making uh, process, which is uh, more inclusive uh, thinking. So conflict, we don't. We as the Chinese, they they believe the problem is an opportunity. So conflict is an opportunity, not something, not always a bad thing. There is different type of conflicts. There is uh, intrapersonal. Conflict is within yourself when you have doubts, when you have uh, bias, when you have decision to take. You have the conflict within yourself. It's not always with others. And we have interpersonal conflict between two or more individuals. And we have intra-group conflict within same group or same team, like the team for football team, for example, they have conflict with them. Uh, same team in a company, they can conflict. They can have conflict, and we have intergroup conflicts that we are focused on it uh, in this uh, because it's more social conflict. It's it happens between two different groups, at least two different groups, like two teams, two companies, or situations, two races or three races uh, between ethnic or religious group people of sexual uh, orientation, different sexual orientations, sometimes between gender and sometimes between political groups and between nations. So we are focusing on this type of conflict in, in uh, this uh, session. To understand some concepts and how interfaith uh, can contribute in these uh, ma major concepts that we are talking about, today, the conflict prevention, conflict transformation, and peace building. Let's understand what each terms mean. Conflict prevention is about building the capacities and resilience of a community of, or a society. It's about proactive measures taking to prevent tension and disputes from escalating into violence or open hostil hostility. Uh, this normally by addressing the root cause of conflict and try to solve them in uh, peaceful measures. While conflict transformation, which uh, which is uh, very important tools that require a lot of time and efforts because it's grassroots, you need to work in grassroots and in the systems and the structures of any community. It's about changing the nature of conflict, its relationship, its dynamic to create opportunities for constructive change and resolution. It's normally changing the concept of, of conflict into a concept of peace or uh, making the, the problem opportunities. And it's... Uh, you know, when we said transformation is changing radically the situation. We are not speaking about a little development, we radical change, everything. Uh, for example, uh, if you want to solve the, the conflict in the Holy Land between Palestine and Israel, 
the conflict transformation maybe make them one state with equal opportunities and you know just transform the relationship the concept the structures to another uh, another concept or another state status peace building is contain all these things conflict prevention and conflict transformation it's a wider range of activities uh, and it can be on uh, government's level or even in international levels and grassroots level as well. So it's very comprehensive term. It's about creating a peace and just society. And it addressed normally after or post-conflict, uh, uh, let's say communities or countries or societies. And to build the infrastructure for lasting peace is like lay the foundation for lasting just peace. So with these with these uh, terms, we understand that they are interrelated. We cannot uh, separate them, but we will like uh, see how the tools of each uh, term can. Uh, include interfaith elements, interfaith dialogue uh, within them. As you can see, there's some tools, activities, and strategies to handle conflict. When we speak about uh, diplomacy, dialogue, negotiation, mediation, legal settlement, arbitration, early warning systems, inquiry or conflict analysis about gathering and finding facts, these, we can say they are more into conflict uh, management and prevention. They are short term somehow, uh, but the prevention also contains some long term like structural reforms as part of uh, prevention because all of uh, peace building and uh, conflict transformation contribute to conflict prevention. So we can see confidence building measures. It takes time to build confidence. Uh, reconciliation. Reconciliation actually happens after a long-term uh, conflict normally. And it's uh, about collaborating to find a way out of conflict. So it's a long-term peace building and conflict transformation uh, mean. Structural reform, which is the most complicated things, but it is very, very uh, important, important for the three uh, approaches to conflict. Uh, like uh, it's, it's about addressing the root causes of tension and violence. The root causes could be poverty, inequality, political exclusion, by promoting inclusive politic economies and societies or social uh, rights. And here comes the interfaith. Interfaith is about structural reform. It can be part of dialogue, negotiation. Everything can be part of it, but it's good to include the religious freedom and religious right as we are doing structural reforms. Uh, we cannot, uh, you know, forget about the role of religion in conflict. Uh, this is the latest, and I think the the numbers now after the, let's say, conflict in uh, Holy Land and on Ukraine, it would be increased more and more. Here, as we see, social hostilities related to religion. When I say social, they mean it's like by people, not by or by non-government actor, non-state actors, they call them. And we have another things and another uh, statistic about the government harassment. As we can see, out of 198 countries in uh, 2019, 43 countries 43 countries have 
social conflict or hostilities. You see, the number was uh, during the Arab Spring and to 2011, to 2012, and this was very high. And it's slow down then become higher and higher. And I expect it to, to go up and up. So there is really just really justly motivated conflict in half of the world at least. Uh, this is the statistic that accredited by many, uh, let's just say, uh, literature reviews, but some statistics show there is religiously motivated violence or social religiously motivated violence in 100 countries. So religion is still a source of conflict and religion is part of the culture and the culture is, you know, the conflict uh, based on culture is very widely known by everybody. Uh, let's speak about government out you know, like out of 198 countries, 163, 82% government authorities interfere in worship in ways such prohibiting certain religious practice, cannot have freedom of access to worship or to do ritual or to build uh, temples or mosques or chairs, whatever. So the government most government, the majority government is hurting or harass, harassing the uh, interfaith minorities and communities. Um, maybe not only minorities, because in some countries, the majority is being suffer out of government uh, structural actions against them. So not only the minority. In MENA, Alhamdulillah, all countries have <laughs> the government interfere in uh, or have negative, negative uh, influence on religion. In Europe, uh, which is astonishing, 90% of countries in Europe are having negative impact on religion or religious minority or religious majorities. In Sub-Saharan, we have 80%. In Asia Pacific, we have 70% of countries. This gives us indicator how religiously motivated conflict is a reality we need to deal with it. Speak about my journey, my interfaith journey. I would like to share this is how I... I come up with this. Uh, my internet work is like the gradual illumination, illumination of a, a downing sun is when the sun comes rising in the morning is very slowly. A process that unfolds steadily over time. You need years, years to discover things about the others. It's not like crash course or uh, a, f a fleeting moment, like a flash of light, that you can, oh, you can become an interfaith activist. No, it takes time. Uh, it's need uh, persistent and evolving realities because each year, each community, each uh, confrontation with people from different religion means a lot give you a lot of insights, a lot of perspectives on life, how you view lives. So you keep changing as an interfaith activist over time. Uh, I, 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 you know, look at it as lifetime marathon and it's voluntary. Nobody will force you to become an interfaith activist. It's not about speed because it's about how you can respect, love, empathy, and accept the others. Empathy is very important uh, emotional intelligence skill. How we can put ourselves on the other shoe, how to look things from the other perspective. This is very difficult, but you can develop it over time. Each individual's 
traverse, traverses his journey or their journey at their own unique uh, pace. Some people take time, some people do it quicker than the others. There is no time limitation for interfaith work, but all interfaith work will contribute to a more peaceful and understanding world that everybody would love to contribute to. This is a very uh, important uh, statement by the author of the moral, moral imagination, uh, The Art and Soul of Building Peace book. It's a very nice book. I recommend that you read it. John Paul said, the mystery of peace is located in the nature and the quality of relationship developed with those most feared. This is the people who fear from others. The relationship, if you wanna, if you wanna do peace with what they, what they called enemies, let's say, so you need the mystery, you can uh, find it in the relationship. How natural, how high quality you establish relationship with your, what you may think is your enemy is who fear you and you fear them. This is the most important thing to discover what or how you can do peace. So relationship again and again is very important. Without relationship, you cannot do interfaith dialogue and you cannot do peace building as well. So the interfaith journey, it's based the, the road to peace. Is it, is it a journey? Because it does not have a destination. It's just you, you do you go through the journey until you die, let's say. It's like a constant effort. It's about continuous learning. You discover and explore the others. You need to be curious about the other, sensitive about the other, to keep learning and uh, explore, exploring what's the other then the relationship becomes stronger. The more you know about the other, the differences and similarities, the relations start to evolve, evolve. And during this, when you establish relationship, you contribute to your personal growth and development. So you shift, you, uh, you transform your life and behavior. You start to act differently because what you learned and the relationship. And this is continuous. You keep learning and you keep evolving. As you see, this journey is continuous journey. So I'm still in this and everybody who is active in interfaith will remain the entire, his, her, their entire life in this circle. Why interfaith is important? We cannot deny as I said at the beginning, when I did a, a survey, even atheist people, they still use relig uh, religious traditions as uh, norms, as values, morals, ethics, as part of their uh, identity. So religion is a very powerful component of cultures. Some say uh, it's it's 90% of your uh, culture is your religion, if you are from uh, a, a religious background or if you are religious. So we cannot say religion is not important. Is As you say, culture is not important. Also, uh, the value systems of uh, each religious uh, tradition provide a guidance for us how to live and how to understand the world. So religion provides a framework for understanding the world, how we view our views on the world. Even some will say that not all religions call uh, for uh, 
peace and love. This is wrong. If you read or religious text, I was exposed to 80 religious texts. All of them call or advocate for peace non and nonviolence. Uh, we need not to forget when we read the text to read the background because there is background behind each text that people do not uh, understand or give efforts to read to understand the text, the holy text. So it's it's the call of love and peace in every religion. And this is from a, my experience, I can say, and I can affirm. Also, religion contributes to our political, social, and economic life's attitude. We cannot deny this. It's part of the them. And uh, religions provide spiritual resilience. There's in every conflict, there is spiritual aspects, psychological aspects that only religion can heal and can make people resilient. So it is important for us. Uh, people can survive on resilient uh, resilience because of their belief, deep belief. Also, uh, religions provide a moral alternative during the period of wars, conflict, collapse, whatever. So the, the, the social system will continue because of religion, even the, if the states collapse, for example. And it happens in Latin America, it happens even in, in Jordan during the, the co some conflicts, the religion kept people behaving well and respecting the others. So it is alternative uh, uh, moral system that can help managing the state if the state is collapsed or if there is conflict, big conflict. Also, religious traditions, now they are making a platforms for global, globalizing the peace building and conflict resolution. We can see URI, for example, is a global organization. Uh, it has more than 1,000 uh, NGO as a group uh, members, and they are working together to stand uh, with peace and nonviolence. Also, world religions. We are seeing a lot of global platforms that affecting the uh, the world actions, or they having pressure on uh, any conflict. So, really, really, uh, religious institutions are becoming stronger, despite the fact that people are away from religion. But this is what we see in the ground. In the ground, there is a lot of actions done by these institutions. All religions encourage respect, peaceful conflict, resolution, and reconciliation and justice. This is a nice word. We need to remember that no peace among the nations without peace among the religions. No peace among the religions without dialogue among the religions. So we need interfaith dialogue to secure peace. This is the roadmap to peace. It's very easy and it is acceptable. Human rights, we need a human rights, equality, respect and justice. And the major things in human rights that nobody disagree, everybody agree that respect of human dignity. Human dignity means freedom. Freedom means freedom of the religion of, or belief. And freedom of the religion will encourage interfaith. People will become vocal. They speak about their faith. And this will end up the real peace that we're looking for. Now, just to connect the source of conflict with the, uh, the sources of conflict or causes of conflict. As we can see, data or information is one of the major causes or sources of conflict. Lack of information make conflict. Misinformation make conflict. 
different access to information also uh, different interpretations uh, different assessment processes or procedures all these lack of information or something anything related to information can cause conflict and here we can say if i don't have access about or information or knowledge about the other i will have uh, doubts as we see in the videos because i don't know i start to establish a stereotype and suspicious suspicious uh, thoughts about uh, the other so lack of information because we don't have dialogue we don't have uh, uh, let's say uh, respect and understanding for others because we don't have information for example i'll give an example recently uh, i was in a meeting and i asked uh, uh, one of my colleagues uh, how americans uh, look at jihad she told me if you ask any american in san francisco what's jihad he she they will say it's uh, killing americans but if they have access to information jihad as islamic term is mean is struggle against your desire is struggling to commit to the right path to do good things is the biggest jihad and the smallest jihad is the fight if somebody kick you from your homeland and if somebody try to uh, take your properties or ag uh, aggression against make ag ag aggressive action against you so this lack of access for information always make the conflict then we move to the values and cultural attitudes as we say most values and cultural attitudes in many uh, countries are coming from religion. So interfaith aspect, aspect is very, very important here. Uh, the culture, which is in short, it's like the way of life, how we live. It's about ideology, about our ethnic, ethnicity, uh, religion, uh, how we evaluate ideas and behavior, which is core of our faith or religion. So if uh, we have different values, different way of life, different ideologies, different beliefs, or judge, uh, judging for behavior, we will have the clashes. Here comes the interfaith dialogue to prevent any clashes because we need to understand each other to increase respect and acceptance, as we said in the beginning, to reduce any conflict out of cultural attitudes and values. Then we come to the relationships, which is the core of any uh, peace building process is strengthening the relationships. Relationships is about strong emotions, stereotype, misperceptions, misconceptions, poor communications, relative negative behavior. All this can make conflict and to reduce stereotype or to debunk stereotypes and misconceptions we need interfaith dialogue then we come to interest or position this is very uh, common in uh, in corporate world but it is in interfaith it's very uh, important when we talk about uh, intangible interest and positions like recognition, respect of security, uh, especially for religious minorities, that they need this to avoid, uh, to, to feel secure. And this is, if you don't have security or recognition or respect, this is inspire, uh, this insp inspires uh, conflict. Any competition between religious uh, traditions will, cause a conflict as well. So not only on resources or territories, the conflict can be on uh, religious things as well. Then we have the structures which is very, very 
complicated and needs a lot of conflict transformation and uh, peace building efforts to to avoid any conflict uh, st stems from uh, structures. The structure is about unequal control, ownership, or distribution of resources, uh, unequal power of authority, which is like uh, some religious groups are the dominant in any country. They this will you know this will let the others feel uh, uh, the grief or the unfairness, so they will do conflict. And sometimes we have like geographical or physical constraints and destructive uh, patterns of behavior. This these are can make a conflict. For example, uh, if uh, for example if any religious minority cannot, for example, own land, this is unfair and will make conflict. Like in Philippines, we have these uh, overlands. The conflict st started more than 100 years ago when Philippines was under occupation and the, and the Muslims were not uh, allowed to own lands. So they have to work with the Christian and this is the conflict still until now because this is structural uh, inequalities or resource distribution. So things, it's very hard to change, but they are essential. If you change structures, we can change everything and structures needs to work on grassroots and grassroots needs to establish understanding through dialogue and particularly uh, interfaith uh, dialogue here as we see uh, the conflict are easy to handle which is relationship when it's relationships information or data or interest or position this you can you can do conflict management if you have position you can do conflict resolution you can do conflict prevention it's very easy to handle this when it's related to information relationships and uh, interests it's they call it negotiable it can be negotiated but here is the issue where we have the culture and, and which is somehow represent religion and the structures is they are very difficult. You need conflict transformation and peace building. And interfaith is one of interfaith dialogue, one of the tools that you can handle these uh, sources of conflict. Here is an exercise, you can do it, try to do it by yourself what we can do to handle data for example we can we can uh, uh, translate the religious text in in understandable language for example for everybody in the community uh, we can highlight the the terms that there's a lot of misunderstanding on it or misconception of some terms of each religion for interest and position we can secure the minority's right to to practice their ritual or to build their temples, whatever, to, to meet their interest and uh, position. Relationship. Relationship is we need to, 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 to prevent uh, any uh, hate speech, for example. We can uh, put uh, rules and regulations for certain terms that can be uh, can provoke negative emotions for people, for example. Values, cultural attitudes, here we can do interfaith workshops. We can do, uh, we can change the systems of any discrimination. For example, uh, some, some countries remove the, the religion from the identity card. So nobody will know what's religion and nobody will discriminate. So you have access to everything as everybody. The structural things is, is very, very important. We can go for a school uh, uh, and teach them how to be tolerant and how to accept differences and maybe to put some material about the other religions uh, in the community. 
here's the last thing in how we can uh, how can you know uh, the youth uh, work and youth program contribute to intercultural learning i would like to to build in this uh, stage of cultural sensitivity it's a model that you can find it uh, on the internet and i think uh, uh, many many erasmus plus projects are using it we enter our uh, any intercultural confrontation at the beginning of our experience with youth exchanges intercultural youth camps whatever we we passed through these these steps and normally uh, we stuck in 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 some some people cannot move it all if you can move it all you will have you will become a global citizen or with intercultural mindset but not all people can move until the end so at the beginning when we have like any intercultural sitting young people they are unaware of or unable to recognize cultural differences or they are not interested they they just get together uh, then when they start to uh, interact they start to feel the differences so they become in a polarization stage the mentality of us that's them uh, us there's them or either with us or against us this this mentality normally happens at our early uh, experience of exposure with youth exchanges we start to uh, judging people like uh, oh they are they are not good enough uh, our culture is much better than their culture look how they act this is unbelievable so uh, you start to evaluate and judge at this time and sometimes you feel your your culture is superior or most of time <laughs> and some people say no my culture are not superior they are their culture is better than mine so these things happens normally and this is very uh, you know erasmus plus projects will move people from this stage when they have interaction and established relationship people from different cultures, different really religious traditions, they move from this stage to the other stage because of the, the Erasmus sitting, our youth uh, project uh, sitting. So they move to minimization. Minimization is very critical uh, stage because uh, young people, they start to uh, de-emphasize differences. They say, okay, we have more uh similarity than uh, differences we are all human and we are all enjoy freedom of choice whatever so why to bother and learn about the others okay they are good as a friends but i want i don't want to uh, go through our differences i will focus on what we can live together what we can enjoy most people young people even old people uh, stick in this stage they don't move from minimization he said okay okay you workshop whatever i i i have my religion you have your religion i don't want to know about you but we all call for be all religions call for peace and love let's focus on this this is very critical stage because some people never move from here step forward then the good people and the intelligent people and let's say the more open-minded people move to acceptance if you move to acceptance you do strong analysis for uh, differences and similarities not focus on similarities and what the minimum requirement to live together no they go deeper they appreciate both differences and similarities uh, they, if you accept this, you are in a stage of acceptance that we wish to reach. This is very important to reach. And if you are in acceptance stage, 
it is fine. And if Erasmus projects manage to get 50% uh, of the people engaged in Erasmus Plus projects to acceptance stage, this is wonderful, great. Then some, some smart and more open-minded people, they move to adaptation. Adaptation is, you know, you understand, you appreciate, but you adapt, you start to act accordingly, to respond to cultural differences. Here is the empathy we said, you put yourself in the other shoes and start to appreciate what they appreciate and to be sensitive to what they are sensitive to. So if you move to adaptation, it's great. And maybe uh, maybe some people, 25% normally from my expectation to the people we engage. Uh, it's worth mentioning that we, we have done more than 100 Erasmus Plus projects. We host around 12 in Jordan and the other in other countries. So we can tell how young people change. So some people reach the adaptation. Most people are stuck with minimization. And uh, a few, like less than 5%, reach the integration stage. Integration stage is very difficult to reach when you think that no religion, no culture is superior to another. Uh, recognize differences between cultures and belief and adapt to accommodate. So this is very, very few people reach it. Then you have the intercultural mindset or the, let's say, fully uh, global citizen. So this is my presentation. I hope I, uh, I managed to finish in one hour. Um, exactly one hour, actually. Yeah. Um, 59 minutes, to be precise, because oh. I was checking the time when you started. So you saved one minute. <laughs> in your presentation but thank you so much it has been extremely structured and very interesting and put a lot of puzzle pieces from our previous sessions also in one picture which i i want to thank you for that uh, particularly i think it was also giving a, some deep reflections about uh where we live now and uh, about our identities and we will be talking about identities in the next uh, uh, edition of ID Talks in, in two weeks. So I think it's a good also moment to bring that into our perspective. Thank you very much. Let's see, um, we have about 15 minutes till the end of our today's talk. We decided as a team in the background chat that we will not go into breakout rooms because the group is not very big anyway, and we could still all stay together here. And also um, let our audience for once here the question answer session. So the broadcast will continue till the end of today's ID talk, which is quite exceptional, I have to say. So um, uh, now we are happy and ready to take some questions from the audience. In the meantime, Anush here is asking a very big question, but maybe you can give a shorter or your personal answer to it. When will humanity create one face, in your opinion, Mamun? Is yeah. it ever possible? Yes, it is not. And diversity is a blessing, so <laughs> it will not. But I, I can give like an example. Imagine we are in the bottom of mountain and many and the reality is in the top of the mountain and different uh, people are climbing the mountain in different routes. They all walk different routes toward the top of the mountain to find the ultimate goal, let's say one faith or the reality of faith. So these people are moving in different way and they will struggle to reach the top. So they will meet at the top. So there's different routes, but they will lead us to uh, one reality at the end. If we are uh, proof to ourselves and we are committed to the good deeds and to the, let's say, to what's good for the humanity and us. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mamun. We have a, another great question in the chat from Vic here. 
who is asking, how could we help others who are stuck in the level of polarization to realize that and step out of it and evolve further and open up? I maybe can um, bring another additional layer to this in a use exchange, in an Erasmus Plus context. What could we do with participants who knowingly come to projects about interface dialogue, about peace building, but still are very much stuck in the polarization phase? Is there something that we could do from your experience, exercise or activity that could maybe open them up and have them a better kind of brighter, broader outer look on the situation? Yes. I think uh, there is a lot of tools like uh, team building tools and it, the tools that uh, uh, storytelling like tools about their own culture to let them understand. The idea is to strengthen the relationship. For the young people, they spend one week together. They might don't like each other at the beginning, but they cry at the end of uh, leaving the the exchanges and this is so common and but as the question some people st uh, stuck in polarization and this is what happens uh, last year a lady from uh, georgia said to a jordanian you are so good to be uh, a jordanian uh, a muslim uh, and i feel sorry when i see uh, some someone as good as you uh, is not Christian. So I think she's stuck with this. <laughs> but with relationship, doing more projects together, it's it's very tiring and the process is a journey. You need to explore. You need to give them chance to explore and establish confidence by relationship. The more relationship, the more projects. For example, if they have like three projects together, I'm sure three Erasmus, three weeks together, they will change. But one is sometimes not enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. And you, you guessed well, I do have a question or two even for me. Thank oh. you. Um, so one question is, how do you motivate or encourage youth workers to work on a topic of faith and religion? Uh, because I... I you started your presentation with that. Um, I think there is a hesitation and a fear of addressing that, especially with uh, with a group of uh, people with diverse backgrounds, because people are afraid of conflicts or that they won't be able to manage the conflict. So that would be the one. And then if you have time, I know that your organization is really active in Erasmus program. Uh, why? Why why are you using Erasmus program? What are the benefits of a program like that for addressing the, uh, the topic of interfaith dialogue? So those would be my two questions if you have if you have time yes. to uh, take them both. Thank you. Yes, regarding the first uh, Mamon, maybe uh, sorry, sorry for interrupting. Maybe we also take Laura's question yes. and then you address all of them together so we can save a bit of time. Please, Laura. Yes, thank, thank you very much. Um it was a very uh, interesting presentation and i i have uh, i i also have two questions uh, the the first one is about the last uh, stage in uh, interfaith dialogue about um, in integration i think it, it's it's called no when when you consider all re religions as equal none of them being superior from uh, others and i i i would like to ask if in in your opinion, we should, however, set some some limits. For instance, if we have a community, uh, a re religious community in which it's okay, they they think it's okay to uh, punish physically the women or children, and we uh, we I think we we couldn't um, we couldn't accept that the practice as being equal with the uh, with other religions in in which beating children is uh, immoral and and how we we, we can set the limits um avoiding re re relativism of ethical values and also re respecting other uh, other communities 
this is the the first question and the second one is about building walls and and about the uh, the video um, you shared with us earlier uh, in which um, uh, it was the the idea that the the, the three uh, persons who in, in initiated the Abraham religions, uh, Moses, Jesus, and uh, Mahomet, they they had good intentions, but they built wa uh, walls. Uh, and my my question is, do, do you think they built the walls personally, or their communities after um, uh, them? Uh, didn't understand them very very well for, for instance i'm i'm a christian and i i consider and i feel that jesus didn't build walls but we the, the christian the uh, christian churches uh, often don't understand his message and we tend to uh, separate um, from each other to divide christianity uh, although uh, christ's message is a message of love and what's your opinion about it Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Nice questions. Yes. Uh, first question, uh, Maria, I need to confess that we established Desert Bloom to attract young people. Because when we work with URI, the, the name URI, United Religions Initiative, is not attractive for young people. So they considered, oh, I don't want to talk about religion. So we attracted young people by changing the name and work in cultural issue. But we understand that uh, like 90% of uh, young uh, people, cult uh, really, uh, culture comes from religion. So we talk about culture and we insert religion as part of the culture. So this is how we do it. And we avoid, for example, when we do our interfaith conference, we it's an annual event and we bring young people and old people as well we choose themes that are general not we said we are not religious people i'm not religious people i'm not really a religious person we, we choose like themes that related to voluntary work environment environmental peace building the last conference for example we choose about how religion deal with refugees how people deal with, uh, for, for example, with uh, others, that uh, the atheist, whatever. So we choose like themes. We don't discuss Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Baha'ism, whatever. We, we, we make it general and we allow for the grassroots to contribute. So those who deliver the sessions are from different religious tradition. So they you know, quote something from their religion so we understand their religion, how they their perspective in different topics. This is the first question. Uh, the, the second question, uh, how we benefit? Here, Erasmus is made for people who will not uh, afford traveling or being in intercultural setting. So we dedicated our Erasmus Plus project for those people who never been traveling to break down stereotypes because, for example, uh, foreigners from global, uh, let's say, north, there is a stereotype. They are uh, coming after our resources. They are supporter of Israel. They are against Arab. So people establish hatred. And we see some, some actions when a war took place in Gaza in 2006. There's a young people who uh, attack uh, two, two young people in different uh, places, attacked uh, tourists, blonde tourists, because they believe that everybody is supporting the occupation. And we have a lot of Palestinians, like half of the population of Jordan, Palestinians. So these young people, when they understand that Europeans are not our enemy, people is not our enemy. This is beyond the grassroots, beyond the people, what's happening. So they, they built understanding and respect to the others. Uh, this way, I think we contribute to, to bringing uh, peace to the region and to, to let them think more uh, as a global citizen than uh, uh, 
a local or you know established living in stereotypes and Hollywood to to see the realities on the ground. This is your question. Hopefully, I answered. Ah, yeah. Now we we go for uh, uh, uniting religions. Uh, this is this is very very important. When I said uh, uh, integration, integration does not mean that I act as this culture or I I I treat it as a good way to discover life, a good way to discover God. Each religious tradition is, uh, let us say, an, an human efforts to explore the existence, the God, uh, whatever spirituality. So I appreciate their efforts that reach to this degree, if uh, the to the degree that they consider life like this, their views in global issues like this and life after death, I, I respect it and I live with it. Does not mean I in, in, embrace it or I believe it. You keep your religion. If you remember the mountains, everybody want to reach the top, but in different way. So all religions are or beliefs or way of life or spiritual uh, approaches. All of them try to, to, to reach uh, a supreme spot in the top of the mountain in different ways. So I respect their efforts, but does not mean that I will follow their rules and climb the mountain as they do. I do it my own way because I believe it. But this does not mean that I should uh, hate them or uh, say that they are wrong. Or This does not mean. The integration is mean, okay, you have your own way. I appreciate your efforts, and this is your own way. So the limitation is always be when, when we talk about religions. You cannot, you know, you arrive, one of its principles that we encourage everybody to commit to his, her, their religion. We do not uh, provide uh, or provoke uh, greed dialogue. We, we talk about cooperation together from different backgrounds. Hopefully this meet your question. Regarding the walls, as I said in the beginning the, of the video, sorry, I used the free uh, video maker, <laughs> uh, you see. So uh, the, the people at the beginning, they were living in harmony. The uh, Abrahamic, let's say, uh, religious traditions, they were living in the Holy Land in a very harmony. Then start the division. So it's not about Jesus or Muhammad or Moses who established the walls. No, it's they were living together. Then the political, economical, uh, material life, many causes make these people to establish the walls. So it is human made or human decision is not uh, doctrine from any religion. And uh, uh, you know, the, the, the idea is uh, in all religions, in Christianity, it's a message for all humanity. Islam is a message for all humanity. Judaism, maybe it's for the uh, the tribe of the Israeli tribes, but I think uh, it's it's a it's also a message for uh, humanity. So no no walls built by prophets or messengers of God. Um, we have one more question, and I will give it to you if only you promise to answer it within like a very short one minute yeah. Uh, answer. Yeah. But I think it's a very important question because also most of our audience coming from youth work field and uh, this learning about methods is important as well. Which methods do you use in projects to share knowledge about different faiths and culture? I hope it's not only this kind of crazy intercultural evenings that young people think is the best way to learn about culture. Yeah, what is your know-how? That's my know-how. Uh, you know, we believe in uh, exposures, like real life exposure to learn through doing it, not uh, in the classroom, like planting trees, like uh, playing uh, any sport, 
or composing music, music together because the real relationship come of doing a real work because they want to have commitment and they want to see that they are achieving something because young people they said oh we are just playing games on the rooms this is this is nothing and we did this we plant uh, we did like a, a community garden with the volunteers from portugal and germany for one day and we we planted trees in a mountain we bring back the diversity to the mountain for this is a good examples thank you very much thank you very much i i'm sure the more we talk the more questions might come but we need to be aware of time we are actually already a little bit past the time so this means we have a moment to see the work that Olaja has been creating in the background, I think is a good moment for you, Olaja, to take over the screen. And then we come back to um, close today's ID talk. Okay, so I hope you can hear me and that you can see my screen. Uh, this is the little recap. Thank you, Mamun, for uh, a very structured and, let's say, coming from many areas, uh, we got you know, types of conflict, sources of conflict, uh, ideas of tools and activities to deal with conflict. So, uh, yeah, very condensed information, definitely. And also with this uh, bits and pieces from the practice. So this is the first draft as usual. And uh, I enjoyed it a lot. And everyone will receive the final version in a week's time, more or less. Thank you. I look nicer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yes, you're differently dressed in this picture. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, Mamun, maybe if you would like to say some final words uh, to our audience before we close today's session, the floor is now yours. Yes, I, I recommend uh, everybody to, to be an activist in interfaith because uh, this will let you uh, understand yourself and contribute to the world peace. We are not uh, the generation for material life. We need to, to have more face-to-face -face, uh, confrontation and talks and cooperation. Always don't miss any chance of cooperating with somebody from other religion or from other tradition or culture because the learning will be uh, out of the box and out of your, you know, a circle or knowledge so you will learn a lot from the collective wisdom of all cultures and religions yeah thank you very much and thank you very much to our audience here and uh, yeah see you next time everybody bye bye have a great rest of your day